enzymes that are important in cholestasis. And as a very basic, we know that uh, there are two cholestatic enzymes. The first one is going to be alkaline phosphate and the second one is going to be GGT. In that alkaline phosphate is relatively non-specific because it's not only seen in the liver, it can be seen in the bone in the form of bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, kidney in the form of kidney-specific alkaline phosphatase. And we do have in the placenta as well called as placental alkaline phosphatase. And finally, we have that intestinal alkaline phosphatase as well. The question is where in the liver it is seen? In the liver, typically it is seen in the canalicular membrane. So you know what is canalicular membrane? Canalicular membrane is the starting and the basic histological unit across which the bile flow happens from the hepatocyte into the smaller biliary radicals, which is going to be the starting form of this uh, larger bile ducts, right? So that also tells you one important point that in liver injury, in hepatocyte injury also you can have elevated alkaline phosphatase because when you have hepatocyte injury, you are not only going to injure the hepatocyte membrane, you are going to injure the canalicular membrane also, which is associated with the hepatocyte. So whenever there is cholestasis, there will be ALP elevation, but there could be some ASTLT elevations as well. Whenever there is hepatocyte injury, there will be ASTLT elevation, but there could be some form of ALP elevations also. It's not like in hepatocyte injury, you will be seeing only ASTLT elevation and in cholestatic injury, you will be seeing only ALP elevation. So all the enzymes can be elevated in any injury, in any hepatobiliary injury, almost all the enzymes can be elevated. But it's the relative proportions of how much they're elevated will tell you whether it's a cholestatic pattern or hepatocellular pattern or it's a mixed pattern. And that is the reason why we need to know the concept of R value, which we'll be discussing subsequently in the next slide. But right now understand, any enzyme can be elevated in any form of injury, right? So liver, it is present in the canalicular membrane. So that's the reason not only cholestasis, even liver injury can produce elevated alkaline phosphorus and GGT. And what is the normal value, to be honest? Normal value of uh, alkaline phosphorus is somewhere around 40 to 120 units per liter. And the half-life of alkaline phosphatase is somewhere around 48 to 72 hours. That is 2 to 3 days. And then GGT. GGT is relatively specific. I'm not telling 100% specific. It's relatively specific for liver and uh, biliary radicals. So whenever GGT is elevated, it's almost sure that you're actually having a hepatobiliary problem. So some form of cholestasis is going on. And it's relatively very sensitive to cholestasis, which means the first marker to actually rise in cholestasis, GGT. Maybe you can think about 5 prime nucleotides also. Alternative to GGT is, we have something called 5 prime nucleotides. That is also similar to GGT and that is also present only in the bile radicals to an extent. And what is the normal value of GGT? Somewhere around 33 to 50. So this is the normal value of GGT. So whenever you have an elevated alkaline phosphatase, so what is the next step? So you need to confirm that with GGT, you need to follow up with GGT values. If the GGT levels are normal, usually the ALP elevation is due to extra hepatobiliary source. So it's not coming from the hepatobiliary tree. It's coming from extra hepatobiliary source. So what are the reasons for it? So it could be either physiological rise or it could be a pathological rise. Physiological rise can be seen in children where alkaline phosphatase levels can be elevated up to three times the upper limit of normal because of the bone growth and high osteoblastic activity that are going to produce more and more alkaline phosphatase. And it can be seen in pregnancy, especially in the late third trimesters, up to two times elevations can be seen because of the placental alkaline phosphatase. And number three, in elderly patients, especially more than 65, 70, up to 1.5 times elevation of the alkaline phosphatase is quite common. And pathological increase only one condition, especially in old age patients, if it's more than two to three times the upper limit of normal, then you can think about Peger's disease as well. So remember, how will you diagnose Peger's disease in the exam? Patients were coming with uh, bone pain or asymptomatic uh, elevation of alkaline phosphatase, especially more than two to three times the upper limit of normal with normal AST, normal ALT, normal GGT, only alkaline phosphatase elevated with entirely normal LFT apart from alkaline phosphatase. Think about Peger's disease in elderly patients. Whenever GGT is also elevated along with alkaline phosphatase, it's definitely coming from hepatobiliary source only. There's no doubt about that. Hepatobiliary source. So hep reason for uh, elevation of alkaline phosphatase and GGT could be either cholestasis or it could be liver injury, hepatocyte injury. So cholestasis can be of two types, either intrahepatic cholestasis or extrahepatic 
cold chest. We'll be discussing about the details subsequently when we are discussing about the approach to liver function test. But right now, you have two types of cold chest. One is intrahepatic cold chest, another is extrahepatic cold chest, which is differentiated typically in the ultrasound. Whenever biliary radicals are dilated, it goes for extrahepatic cold chest. Whenever biliary radicals are non dilated, it goes for intrahepatic cholestasis. Please understand that cholecystitis without cholidocolithiasis will have normal alkaline phosphatase only. Very, very important point. Isolated cholecystitis without cholidocolithiasis will have a normal LFT. Normal ALT, normal AST, normal alkaline phosphatase and normal bilirubin. Whenever ALP elevated, AST, ALT elevated, bilirubin elevated and you have a cholecystitis, think about associated cholidocolithiasis also. Cholecystitis without cholidocolithiasis, normal LFTs, especially normal ALP. Very important point. So liver injury, there are multiple forms of liver injury which I have discussed already, so I am not going to discuss any further. And there is another interesting cause of elevation of alkaline phosphates which is a physiological uh, rise in alkaline phosphates which typically happens after a fatty meal. And that has been found to be true especially in two blood groups, blood group O and B. So people who are bearing blood groups O and B antigens, so tend to have increased alkaline phosphates after fatty meal. Suppose if you have this rare suspicion, then probably you can repeat the LFT in fasting state. But generally that is not required. You can do LFT at any point. And isolated elevation of GGT can be seen in certain situations. So GGT, of course, it will be seen in uh, hepatobiliary issues, cholestasis or some liver injury, hepatobiliary injury. So that is where we are going to see elevated GGT. That is the most important. Apart from that isolated elevation of GGT, apart from hepatobiliary injury, you can see in patients who are alcoholics, especially heavy alcoholism tends to, and, and these patients tend to have elevated GGT levels. Why? Because alcohol can induce this GGT enzyme. That is the reason. And there are other drugs apart from alcohol that can induce the GGT. So that people who are taking phenotoin, phenobarbitone, or those who are on OCPs, can have elevated GGT levels. Isolated elevation of GGT, not alkaline phosphatase. And then people who are morbidly obese can also have elevated GGT levels. So clear? So that concludes our discussion on uh, enzymes of cholestasis. Subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from PrepLadder.